Hi, I'm Jimmy Eversole, Technical Director here at Hope Lutheran Church, and on behalf of the pastors and staff, we'd like to welcome you to worship. If you're a first-time guest, we are so honored that you chose to worship with us, and we pray that you would feel the love and grace of Jesus. If you have any questions or you need any assistance, please find one of our ushers, and they'd be more than happy to help you. Now, I'd like to ask everyone, please take a moment and fill out the pew pads. And remember, please write clearly because, well, we'd like to be able to read it. And finally, if you would, take the next few moments and prepare your minds and prepare your hearts for worship. May you be blessed richly. Thank you. Good morning, people of God. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ on this beautiful day where he gathers the people of God to sing praise to our Lord, to give thanks for God's presence in our lives through the gift of Christ, the Holy Spirit dwelling here with us, and the love we share with one another. It is a wonderful time to know Christ and to make Christ known. That's what we gather here to do today, um, as we do every week. And if you're a newcomer in our midst, we're glad you're here to be part of that. We're excited about getting to know you, about sharing our faith with you, and walking in the journey of life with you, whether you're here or on the internet. Um, please make yourself known. Feel free to ask questions. Get involved where you'd like to get involved. <clears throat> Forgive the pastor. I'll say up front, I've had laryngitis all week. I'm not promising a short sermon. <laughs> but if this goes out, we're done. I'm just letting you know. But uh, we are glad you're here. Uh, if you're new in our midst, when we come to communion later in the service, I want to let you know this is not Hope's table. Um, it's, not, it's not a Lutheran table. It is the Lord's table of grace. Wherever you're from, if you commune where you're from, please come to this family table and enjoy God's grace and gift of his presence with us today. We're excited that you are here. There are several announcements for this morning. Uh, the first is to let you know there is a, a, a series of concerts beginning to support the Seeds of Hope. 
Uh, most of us probably know what that is by now, but if you don't, Seeds of Hope is an organization that raises money um, to support both the Wildwood Food Pantry and the Wildwood Soup Kitchen. They also provide actual food. So they have places all over this region where they collect um, canned goods and non-perishables as well as financial donations. And one of the ways they really help support that is to do a sermon, uh, sermon series, to do a concert series, which is much better at raising money than a sermon series, I'm just saying. Um, but they do a concert series. So we have two concerts here. The first is this week, February the 5th, Tuesday, at 6 p.m., when we will have the Lenny Wilson Quartet here. And I can't remember who's singing with them, but the Lenny Wilson Quartet will be here uh, at that time. There is no cost for these uh, concerts. You just bring a canned good and a little money to donate to the program, and I'll be very grateful for that. The second concert is on February the 17th, also at 6 p.m. here, um, and that's with Mary Jo Vitale. I know who she is. It, it, for those of you, she made, she made a point of saying last night, for those of you who don't know, she's my wife, because I made a joke about her last night, and she said, some people probably don't know we're married, and you were just taking a pot shot at me. I was like, oh, that's a good point. So uh, she'll be here with us. We hear her often here at church, but she'll be here again on the 17th. Please plan on attending those if you can. Support that ministry. There is a great deal of need for the hungry in our area. We don't think about that often living in the villages, although I have dealt with people who are hungry from within the villages as well. Um, but there is a great deal of need in this general area, and this is one of the wonderful ways um, that the community comes together as one to support them and provide for them. And we thank you in, support, in uh, advance for the support you will offer. Also, I want to let you know about um, two deaths we've had in the congregation. Barbara Weinheimer passed away about a week and a half ago. We uh, asked for prayers for both her brother Jim as well as her husband Jim, two different Jims, um, in their loss and pray God's blessings upon them that he will shower his mercy and his presence upon the family and surround them with his people to love on them. The memorial service for Barbara to celebrate her life is this Tuesday, this Tuesday at 10.30 here at Hope Central. And then we got word Friday late that Ben Bierke passed away um, on that day. Um, Corinne called the church to ask if we could have a service for him, and we will uh, have set that up to be on Monday the 11th, Monday the 11th at 10.30, also here at the Central Campus. We ask that you would support Corinne and the family with your love, your prayers, and that God's presence would be profoundly felt by them in this time of need. We also have some uh, new events and, and some important events coming up. One I want to just kind of pick your interest with, which is uh, what you'll hear much more about in the next couple weeks, is we're starting a new worship opportunity. Um, for us, it's a, it's a once a month thing we're doing now. It will grow perhaps in the future. But it's a campfire service. Now you might wonder what a campfire service is. Um, if you want to think about being back in summer camp, things like that, around a bonfire, you have a good idea of what it's going to be like. A Thursday evening service at 6.30 at our Lake Weir campus at an actual little bonfire. I'm um, having an acoustic set of music and singing songs that are easy to sing and fun to sing and joyfully worshiping together in a very different, very kind of loose fashion. Um, this is a way of reaching out to the families and those who do not go to church, who might never darken the door of a church, to invite them to an opportunity and experience um, of God's grace in their lives that is different and unique. Um, you all, of course, are cordially invited to be there as well. Um, but I will tell you, if you come, I have an expectation as the pastor that you will come and be hospitable and be part of the welcome team for those who don't usually come. I'm going to let them know that God loves them. But it will be a wonderful time when we're starting that on Thursday, February 21st. And again, more information will follow in the days ahead. Then lastly, there's a very important meeting today. It is our annual meeting. It's not a meeting of two football teams. It's a very important meeting today at 1245 right here. Um, this is the annual meeting where we vote for membership on council. It's where we uh, vote on whether or not we're doing this land swap deal with the villages for a southern site. There's some very big, important things happening, and you all need to be here. It's your church. Please come and plan on not only attending but voting. Now, here's another word for you. Um, because you came early... You can go away and have lunch or breakfast, or I guess breakfast for you, and come back um, and be a part of that. But you have to get your little vote voucher in order to vote. That's something we've been doing for about two years. It's the proper way of doing things. Um, you don't have to wait till the last minute to get it. By that, I mean please don't wait till the last minute to get it. Uh, since 7.30 this morning, you've been able to go in the fellowship hall and get that done. Um, so you don't even have to, walk, to shake the pastor's hand on the way out. Just go and get your voucher and go get brunch and come back and be a part of the service. We hope and expect that you will be here for that. Again, about 1245 here in this room, 
get your voucher first. If you're not a voting member and you want to come and be a part of it and have voice and be able to hear, you can still do that. Uh, but, but to be able to vote as a voting member, you have to get your little certificate. So please be sure to take care of that. And those are all the announcements I have. I encourage you to stand where you are. Greet those around you with the peace and love of Christ. Let's worship the Lord. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates us and forms us, who redeems us and calls us, who unites us and sends us. Amen. Gathered in God's presence, let us confess our sin. Mighty and loving God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We seek our own way. We divide the body of Christ. In your mercy, cleanse us and heal us. Let the words of our mouths, the thoughts of our hearts, and everything we do be filled with faith, hope, and love. Amen. Hear the voice of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim release to the captives. In the name of Jesus Christ, I declare to you that your sins are forgiven and you are released. The joy of the Lord is your strength, and the gifts of the Spirit are yours forever. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
us pray together. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. Now speak, Lord, in this moment while we wait on thee, and hush our hearts to listen with expectancy. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is a small portion at the end of a much larger lectionary piece, about 20 verses longer than what we actually read, that encompasses a whole dialogue Jesus has on uh, the proper way of doing things. He begins by telling them, uh, the disciples, how to properly fast and what ways to do that, and talks about proper almsgiving and how to do that in the right-hearted way rather than the right visible way. And then he teaches them how to pray. And he teaches them with a prayer we all know so very well. It begins, Our Father. What's the name of that prayer? We say it all the time, don't we? It's a familiar prayer. I figured since we know it pretty well, I wasn't going to make you have to hear it read for you. We'll say it together later. Um, but it does tie in well with what we're speaking about in our text that we did hear just now that Bruce read. It, it ties together because if we follow from that prayer into this statement about worry, uh, then we can kind of see how God has already provided a means for this to become real in our lives. But the reality is, worry is a part of who we are in the world today. So let me ask you a couple questions. Like, get your arms loosened up because I do want you to raise your hands because I can't see you well with the lights in my face. How many of you pray on a regular basis? How many of you worry on a regular basis? <laughs> now, we laugh, and I chuckle too, but the reality is, should we really be able to do both so readily? Should we really be able to pray to our Father in Heaven who loves us so much that we call Him Daddy in the prayer, that there's that connection that's so intimate and so familiar and so joyous when we go to Him in prayer that we should trust that He provides for us and gives us what we need? Should we really be able to worry when we pray to a God who loves us enough that He gave His only begotten Son for us? What's the kind of joy we're supposed to have in prayer rather than worry prayer? Well, I want you to think of the word Daddy. When I hear that word the most, besides when my kids want something, is when I come in the door at the end of the day and my daughter throws her arms wide and comes running to me and Lila says, Oh, Father, I am ever so glad you have made it home once more. <laughs> well, she doesn't really say that, but Mary Jo is practicing for, you know, my fair lady, so she does sound a little more like a cockney person from the 1900s more and more. Uh, but the reality is that's not what she says. What does she say? Daddy, and comes running over. It fills my heart with joy. It fills God's heart with joy when we pray that way. She also yells, Uncle Bruce, and runs to you too, technically, so it happens that way. But she runs with joy and excitement, ready to be in my presence. That's what prayer is supposed to be for us. That's the way Jesus begins teaching us to pray. And yet we are worried people. In fact, 
we worry a lot, even we praying types. Maybe it's because we're told we should worry. I mean, if you're like me and watch TV quite a bit, you'll notice that at every commercial break, there seems to be a commercial for anxiety medication. Have you noticed that? It's on all the time. Are you feeling these symptoms? Maybe you should call your doctor and ask him for this med. Be worried. Something's wrong with you. Worry about your health. Worry about your job. Worry about your family. Worry about your security and your future. The world constantly tells us we should be anxious all the time. How is that working? Why is it that somehow the voice of the world telling us to worry has outweighed or, or shouted out the voice of God who tells us not to worry? How can we get back to where we're supposed to be? You know, we worry about a lot of things. We worry about today. And we worry about tomorrow. And we worry about yesterday sometimes. Now, Jesus doesn't talk about about yesterday. You notice that. He speaks about today and tomorrow. But I do want to speak about yesterday because I deal with yesterday with people a lot. Um, I do a lot of counseling and have for the last 20 years. And when I do a lot of therapy with people, the two major things I do therapy on, including when it's with couples, are depression and anxiety. All the stinking time. People come in that are carrying burdens they've carried for years and years, perhaps from their childhood, uh, pain that they've felt, pain that they've caused, worries they've had, guilt or shame that has been weighing them down. And these are people who come to church regularly, wherever their church is, and they pray the corporate prayer of confession and forgiveness, and they partake in the sacrament, and they hear the word of God proclaimed that God loves them, and God is forgiving, and God is gracious, and yet somehow they're still burdened by these things. And it causes anxiety in them, because it's not matching what they hear should be real. And they come seeking solace, somebody to free them, well, I have a newsflash for you. Even trained therapists cannot free you from those things, but they can lead you to the person who can. And so I will often, in the middle of a counseling session, if they're a person of faith, stop and do a special service of individual confession and forgiveness. Shriving, they used to call it. And I will watch as years roll off of that person and they leave a much different person than they were when they came in the office. Not because I did something, but because they met the grace of God in a meaningful way. We need to reacquire that in our hearts and lives so that we can be people of faith and of joy and not people of worry. So if you're a person who's dealing with the, the past right now, we'll get back to the present and future in a second. If you're dealing with something from the past, let me remind you what Scripture says of that that if we confess our sin, if we lay our brokenness, our burdens before the Lord, he will separate them from us as far as the east is from the west. God is already willing to remove that from you. Leave it here today. Leave it at the altar when you come for communion. Take that burden and lay it down, and instead take into you the grace of God that he offers. And don't think that that burden is yours to pick up and take away again. Don't be an Indian giver with God. Leave it where it lies and go forth and be free. Now back to the scripture of today and tomorrow. Do you worry about today? Do you worry about tomorrow? Do you worry about all the what might happens in your life? Isn't that terrible? Woulda, coulda, shouldas in the past and maybes for the future cause so much stress and anxiety, and I believe part of the reason that's a problem for us that Jesus is telling them not to is because people don't know how to access God's grace. We don't know how to pray properly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I don't know about you, but I was taught the proper way to, prayer, uh, to pray when I was in uh, kindergarten, uh, back in uh, my kindergarten, uh, actually, Sunday school. And that was to fold my, if you can say it, fold my, yes. bow my, yes. and close my, and then we'd pray. And if I didn't do one of those things, the teacher would tell me that I'd forgotten to do it. And it took me years to figure out the only way she could possibly know <laughs> was what? 
our eyes were open. <laughs> Hypocrisy, which we'll get to in a moment. <laughs> but let's talk about the proper attitude of prayer. I found a wonderful poem that will help us remember what it really means to have the proper attitude of prayer, what it means to really go to the Lord in the right way in prayer. It's a, it's a poem called Cyrus Brown's Prayer by Sam Walter Foss. The proper way for man to pray, said Deacon Lemuel Keys, and the only proper attitude is down upon his knees. No, I should say the way to pray, said Reverend Dr. Wise, is standing straight with outstretched arms and wrapped and upturned eyes. Oh, no, 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 said Elder Slow. Such posture is too proud. A man should pray with eyes fast closed and head contritely bowed. It seems to me his hands should be austerely clasped in front, with both thumbs pointed toward the ground, said Reverend Dr. Blunt. Last year I fell in Hodgkin's well head first, said Cyrus Brown, with both my heels a sticking up and my head a pointing down. And I made a prayer right then and there, best prayer I ever said, the prayingest prayer I ever prayed, a standing on my head. <laughs> what does that tell us about the attitude of prayer? It's not about doing the right form for prayer. It's about a heart that is praying in sincerity. I'm sure he really knew he needed help in that moment, and he cried out to God that God would help him. Why do we wait for emergencies to do that, though, instead of always having that attitude in our prayer? Well, Jesus speaks to this in the broader text, and it comes back to the worry now. He speaks to the, about the Pharisees, and he speaks about the pagans, the Gentiles, and he tells the disciples, don't be like them when you pray. They're worried about how they look when they pray and how they sound when they pray. They want to make sure that in times of corporate or public prayer, they are praying on the busiest intersection in the busiest part of town, and they're doing it loudly and verbosely where, where everyone notices that they're praying. Don't be like them. They're trying to do things right on the outside, but their heart isn't where it should be. They've forgotten what the prophet Joel had to say for the, on behalf of the Lord when he said, uh, rend your heart and not your garments. And then there was the Gentiles, the pagans, he calls them. They were the ones who had many gods to worship, and they would usually have a patron deity, but they would worry all the time about all the other deities. You didn't want to tick off a deity. They were capricious and nasty and vengeful. So they were constantly praying with many, many formulaic prayers and words, and, and they were constantly using language they thought was mystical or magical to try to appease these gods. And they would pray and pray and pray and pray all the time, loudly, and just babble in prayer. And Jesus basically says, sometimes less words are more than many words. There might be a message for pastors and sermons there. No, nah, I can't be. I can't possibly be days. But they were worried mostly not just about what a deity might think. In both cases, they were worried about what who thought? Everyone else. They wanted people to see them and think that they were holy and righteous people. Well, sadly, we in the church have sometimes pushed that idea. Throughout history, even though Jesus taught the early disciples this, there have been times in the church where we have pushed this idea of making sure we do everything in a showy manner rather than doing things in a heartfelt manner. And Jesus says, flee from being like that. Instead, go to the Lord in prayer, your Father, and pray for these specific things. He gives kind of a framework of prayer. And some of those things deal specifically with the idea that God's kingdom will come to the earth, that God's will will be made fully known here, that God's presence will be fully with us here and now. And if we believe that, we pray that, we desire that, and if we embody that in our lives, then the rest of the prayer and the rest of these things Jesus talks about all flow from that. So Jesus moves on to speak about things not only in the prayer, but in this admonition we heard in the scripture today. Don't worry or don't be anxious. Now, I got to tell you, every time I hear those two words, I go back to my childhood in the 80s, and I hear that song, Don't Worry. Yeah. See, remember that. It's a great song. Don't worry. Be happy. I don't know if that's exactly what Jesus was saying, but it had a nice beat, you know. Don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about it. 
Now, when I hear that, in our day-to-day, in my world, it tells you how privileged I am and we all are. I'm not thinking about it the way the people then would have thought about it. I'm thinking about it in the way that I hear the conversation before we go out for the night. When I head to the door and grab the keys to go to the car and I hear a voice, and some of you, well, let's just do a show of hands. How many of you have ever had somebody say to you, you're not going to wear that, are you? (laughs) Anyone else? What are they really saying? You're not going to make me be seen in public with you wearing. That's what they're really saying. When I think about worrying what you wear, it's worrying about that. We have like fashion sense. We, We think maybe that's what it means. That's not what Jesus is talking about, but it's strange that for many that's where they go. The worry is really, will your needs be met? Now, you might not worry about what clothes you wear. Maybe you do. But I'd be willing to bet that many of you have worried about whether or not you will have enough. Is that a big word, enough? What does it mean? How much is enough? I've quoted it many times because it's so good, but Rockefeller said, how much is enough? Just a little bit more. In fact, I'd be willing to bet that many of you have spoken at some point to a financial planner about making sure that you will have enough to what? To last. Last for what? Have you ever thought to ask yourself that question? What it is we're trying to attain with having enough to last for something? What is enough and what is lasting? Last until retirement? Well, most of you have made it there already. Now we're hoping we'll have enough to last till what? Don't want to be morbid. Have enough till you don't need it anymore, right? It's a nice way of saying it. And then we start worrying about, but I want to have enough to leave behind, to to make a difference in the lives of the people I love or the organizations that I care about. Well, newsflash, God's not worried about that as much. God's worried about whether or not you're using the life he gave you now to make a difference now in those lives and those places that need you there. Will we have enough? We worry about it. What if tomorrow is harder than we thought? What does Jesus say? Don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about today. There's enough worry for tomorrow. Be in the present. Be the person God has called you to be. Celebrate God's gift of life and of grace and of joy that you have today. Celebrate what the Lord has already done for you here and now. And live a life of thanksgiving, a life of praise and prayer, a life of service here and now. And then it says, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. Now, we've all felt hungry at some point, but I'm willing to bet none of us have truly been hungry like some other people are truly hungry. And this isn't just about physical sustenance. It's about our spiritual sustenance as well. But I think about those who are truly hungry. Fred Craddock, the great preacher and teacher of homiletics, has a book called Craddock's Stories, and one of the stories he shares is this. He had gone across the state of Georgia, and he was there to at a conference to hear a very well-known speaker, a woman speak on um, world hunger. And he sat and listened, and it was a marvelous talk, and he thought she did a fine job and was very eloquent, and it was a meaningful kind of message, but he can't remember what she said now. What he does remember is the unnamed little old lady with white hair who stood up after her and got to the podium and made one statement in a foreign language that he didn't know. And then she made it again in a different language, in a different language. And she went through 52 languages saying the same statement. And he was blessed, he said, that he had been studied enough in his life that he knew what she said a couple times and that it was the same or very similar. And finally, in her 53rd language, she said it in English for all of those in Georgia. Mommy, I'm hungry. Why don't we have any food? And she sat down. He said, and I was just struck by that, and it would not let me go. And I drove home, mauling it over in my mind what a profound statement that was. There were people who could actually say that. And then I saw a blasphemous sign on a billboard that I had passed so many times in my life. It was right near where I lived. Every day I passed it several times. I looked up at it as it declared in all of its glory, all-you-can-eat buffet, four ninety-five. And he wondered, how in the world do we live in a world like that? 
where both that and a hungry child can coexist at the same time. Notice in the Lord's Prayer, we do not pray in the singular. We never say, Lord, give to me my daily bread. We say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Everything, in fact, is in the plural. And we're not just saying it for us as the people of God. We're, we're really speaking that this loving God whose kingdom has come that we pray for, that we want to transform the world, will actually transform lives and will be made manifest here. And that means that all the people God loves, which is everyone, will be transformed as well. And that things will be done like giving of daily bread. And that we shouldn't worry about our daily bread. But maybe if we really pray for the kingdom and believe that God can transform lives, what we concern ourselves with is that others are fed. And so we come to this day, and I'm willing to bet some of you have some worries you brought with you. How many of you today would like to stop worrying? Really, stop worrying. Do you believe it's possible? Do you really believe it's possible? I do, but I think it's going to be hard because I think anything important in life takes a little work. It's kind of like working out at the gym. Our, our faith needs to be worked out to become stronger and healthier and more vibrant. We can't just let it sit on a shelf and, and hope that it gets better. We've got to work at it. That means we have to trust God more. We have to pray in faith more. We have to take hold of the promises of God more as if they really matter. And when he says, Stop worrying to stop worrying. Oh, it'll take some practice. But Almighty God, I do pray that here and now, you will make yourself real to us in a way we've never experienced. That the presence of Christ will become so real and so vibrant in our lives that it will wipe out the fear we have. That his voice will become stronger than the voice of the world around us. That we will pray to you in hope and in joy that we will pray to you in trust and in thanksgiving, and that out of our prayer life will flow the actions of our life, and it will cease worrying, because we are so filled with the light of Christ that we become brighter people, and we lay aside our burdens that we are lighter ourselves, and we can go forth freed and with joy and share the good news that truly we believe is good, because it's given us freedom and hope. Lord, we thank you for the promise you've given us for the world to come, but the reality that you are here with us in the world today. And Lord, we want to stop worrying. So help us this day to trust you a little more. Help us to follow you a little more closely. And help us to speak a little more joyfully and boldly of the grace you have given to us through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we lift our hearts and voices before you in prayer, together, asking that your kingdom would be established in us and the world around us. We pray for the peace from above, for your loving kindness to be manifest in our lives and the lives of all people. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, we pray for the peace of the world, that compassion will overcome hatred and love overcome prejudice. We pray for the welfare of your holy church and the unity of all peoples. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our leaders, for our bishop and for all the clergy and leaders within your church, for our government officials, the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, that they, being illumined by your wisdom, may seek justice and peace for all. Lord, in your mercy. Great physician, we lift up the aged and infirm, the widowed and orphaned, the sick and the suffering. We ask that you would bring comfort and healing through your spirit and through the skills of those you have called and gifted in the vocations of healing. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Lord, we pray for the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them. Lord, in your mercy. God of peace, we remember all who have died in the hope of the resurrection and for all those who mourn their absence. Abide with those who remain and speak to their hearts of the peace and joy their beloved now experience in the fullness of your presence. Lord, in your mercy. All of these prayers and those that we speak not with our lips but that are voiced in the silence of our hearts we offer to you in the name of our great high priest, even Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Yes, and the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed a good and joyful thing that we should always and everywhere give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved Son. And the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus first took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body which is broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after the supper, he took the cup, and when he given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now as a community of faith, if you'll join hands as you are able. Lord, teach us to pray in our hearts and in the words you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The mystery hidden for the ages is revealed for us in this meal. Come, behold, and receive your God. All of God's people are welcome. You may be seated.
body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his precious blood strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. May God Almighty send you light and truth to keep you all the days of your life. The hand of God protect you. The holy angels accompany you. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Peace, Christ is with you.